we got this going, and what you see here is the first time one of our patients, Bruno, actually walk. Hello, Internet. It is I, Hewlett, and... Uh, Q. Back and again for Geek and Dragon. Another Geek and Dragon episode. We're already talking over each other. Good sign. Um, this is a uh, another Upgrade Required version. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, we're doing a documentary called Upgrade Required, which is about Q's quest to become a man-machine cyborg. Um, and basically a future where disabilities will be rendered obsolete through technology. So we thought we would start discussing some of these technologies and uh, and uh, thinking about where we could go with some of the stuff that we're finding out there on the on the internet. So um, so do you want to introduce this this video for this week? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, most of these will probably probably be TED talks or similar videos. TED uh, talks. Last... TED talks just rules it. I mean, they just yeah, yeah amazing stuff. Uh, last week was. Uh, Sensor replacement slash uh, addition, and uh, this week we have uh, brain computer interface research with uh, Miguel Nicolelis, who is uh, from Brazil. He's great. And he is he's sort of one of the big names that keeps coming up if you look into brain computer interface stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, some context for the people who might be familiar with this stuff. Uh, in the 2014 Soccer World Cup in Brazil, you may recall that, if you watch that, the opening ceremony, the first kick, was done by a paraplegic in a brain-controlled exoskeleton. So, like, sort of the first half or so of this video is explaining how they did that, because uh, Miguel and his team were actually responsible for that whole setup. The frustrating thing about that was that it was such a short, because I was looking for it, because I'd heard it was coming, and if, obviously this pertains to what we're, what we're discussing. Um, and it was just, it was like a split second, and it was done. And I think there was some kind of a mix-up with the schedule or something, and so it sort of got pushed. But what, I mean, it's this incredible feat, um, pardon the pun, um, but it, it still, for some reason, just got sort of brushed aside in all this pomp and circumstance of getting the, the, the World Cup started, which I understand everyone's excited about, but it's just that, you know, this technology is going to change the world. Yeah, and so if, if you did watch that the first time and wanted to know more, this is really the perfect video, because yeah. they go into the whole, because they had, like, what, 18 months mm. to, like, build everything from scratch. Yeah. And he talks about, like, the research they had done with animals and monkeys, and I think maybe a little bit of human testing. Mm. But in terms of, like, actually having a system that could do that kick, they built it from scratch in 18 months, which yeah. is pretty ridiculous. And bringing together scientists from all over the world. I mean, it's another example, again, of the sort of this wonderful sort of purity to science where people... You know, ignore, ignore countries and boundaries and all that, and just get together for eighteen months to figure out how to make you know some kid walk again. I mean, it's yeah, yeah I it's it's inspiring on so many different levels. Um, mm -hmm. uh, now, how does and 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 in that this is controlling voluntary muscle movement? Is this gonna this is gonna relate to you to some extent, right? I mean, how would this? Oh, totally. Again, I maybe for my I, I wouldn't want a walking exoskeleton, mm. uh, maybe an arm exoskeleton, but again, the exact same interface could be hooked up to any kind of external robot or software like they showed with the monkeys playing a virtual game mm. with their mind. So, you know, the, the front end of the interface is exactly what I'm kind of looking for. So if I've got this straight, with the monkeys, basically what they were doing with that virtual setup was they'd wired the monkeys so that they were getting some kind of tactile feedback and having to match that with one of these patches that they were given, right? Uh, well, I think from experience, they knew that... Uh, well, the cool the thing about both the kick and the other research that isn't apparently obvious until they tell you is that the guy wearing the exoskeleton and the monkeys in the experiments were getting sensory feedback from what they were doing and it wasn't just controlling. This exoskeleton was covered with an artificial skin invented by Gordon Sheng, one of my greatest friends in Munich, 
to allow sensation from the joints moving and the foot touching the ground to be delivered back to the patient. So in other words, they weren't just sort of being sort of like lurched around in a machine. They were sensing, they were sensing the ground. I mean, I love that. I love that comment. He says where the guy said he was on the beach in, you know, wherever it was in Brazil somewhere. Yeah. He could feel that, that on, you know, in the movement. The, but with the, with, with the monkeys though, when they were reaching out to touch these things, they were being told which one to touch by the tactile feedback, uh, basically. Well, yeah, and the cool thing about this, the, the research was, the monkey was sort of only thinking about moving its arm at a sort of really high co conscious level, and its actual arm wasn't moving, because it wasn't like trying to grab something specific, mm. but the computer was able to translate the sort of upper level brain waves into knowing, oh, you're thinking about moving your arm this way. Right. I mean, I'm really torn on it because I, I, it's one of those things that I feel like you have to do these tests. I mean, you've got these rats running around with leads hanging out of their heads, but it, I feel like it has to be done because you can't, what are you going to do, experiment on humans? I mean, I, you can't do that. Um, well, you do that eventually. <laughs> yeah, but, well, and they did eventually. Again, using non-invasive technologies that they developed thanks to these more invasive technologies in the past. And there, there are some quite invasive, I've seen some, you know, I've seen uh, you know video of people using the robotic arm where they they literally have the sensors embedded in the back of their, you know, whatever, oh, yeah, yeah. whatever section of the brain that was. So I mean, it's it's being done. So you could control this stuff. You would control this stuff at the brain level, even though you do have some you have some movement still left. Yeah. So for that. basically, with that kind of system, I, I you know I can move my arm a little bit here. You see my arm at yes. the edge of the screen, yeah. but I could just sort of think, oh, I'm thinking about moving my arm, and then the robot would do that, and then my actual arm wouldn't. Right, right. Because I'm just, I'm just thinking about it, and, and again, that sort of higher conscious level, rather than trying to physically, okay, there's a thing over there I need to grab, hmm. let me grab it. Well, the neat thing is, while we're, you know, while we're playing with things like, I mean, we're currently all excited about this, well, I don't know about you, but I am, about this whole sort of exploration of, of Pluto, the, flu, the, the flyby of Pluto mm -hmm. and Sharon. And I just keep thinking, like, imagine in the future we're going to have these ships that are go out there and we'll be able to, we'll be able to feel, you know, we'll be able to feel what they're feeling on the, on the surface of the planets and stuff. Because this can yeah. be controlled from, it doesn't matter, it can be connected to someone or it can be connected to a computer across the planet or across exactly. the space of the galaxy eventually. So, um, I mean, there'll be latency, of course, there, but... yeah. Goddamn light speed delay. Yes, yeah, we got to figure out that light. We got to figure that FTL thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that it just, I mean, for again, science fiction side of stuff, you just start the the possibilities are are extraordinary here. And uh, you know, especially later in the in the TED talk, when they start talking about the game with multiple monkeys. Yeah. I mean, that's basically Pacific Rim. Yeah. That's yeah, that is. The, that's the dual hemisphere system to pilot control for the Yankers. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That it requires, that I guess that, that, I mean, in this situation, it isn't required because the, the, the task isn't so complex that it requires three monkeys to do. But you could think of, you can conceive of things in the future where you would, it would require multiple people, multiple brain control to, to, to function these, uh, or to pilot these things. Again, yeah, I, I, I keep going back to space travel. Yeah. Hey, uh, I didn't really recommend you watch the video, but they did experiments with both two monkeys and three monkeys, where basically they were controlling a virtual arm, but the movement of the arm was averaged between all of the monkeys, so they had to sync up their brain waves to get the arm in the right location for the reward. And they could switch it too, like they could suddenly switch which which sort of uh, axis, the, yeah, yeah, the uh, the monkey was controlling, and they would still just be able to, the brain would just process it and start adjusting for it again. So it's really, I mean, it's it it's it's definitely bleeding leg sort of bleeding edge technology now, but I, the the potential is extraordinary. Yeah, I have a paper that's very recent that I meant to read before we talked about this. Yeah, so we'll just. I read the abstract, uh, but we'll just put it in the description. It's called uh, Building an Organic Computer Device with Multiple Interconnected Brains. Hmm. And I believe this is mainly 
experiments with four interconnected mouse brains, or rat brains rather, and they actually have them solve like computational tasks. Huh. There's a, there's so, a very there's a very interesting um, uh, documentary I watched the other night on on the BBC called uh, Planet Ant, and they were talking about uh, how they were using um, basically I can't, I can't remember what it was called now, but basically they were using the the way that ants go and explore spaces and how they get places and the uh. way they leave tracks of pheromones around behind them and they're using that as a computational sort of basis for how to deliver medical supplies or, or yeah. trucks and how to figure out the the shortest route or the the least fuel um, uh, heavy routes to, to places and planets they started using it to planets as well you know nature is definitely informing our science in an amazing way now mm -hmm. the other thing is we got some amazing have you looked at the comments recently on um, uh, on the what's no, your spidey okay. sense that was one of those things I was going to do and then uh, this morning so I'd be fresh in my mind I'm well, I'm here to I'm here to make you feel guilty basically that's what okay. that's what this, these geek and dragon episodes are just basically to you know, to make you feel guilty about things you haven't okay, done. Okay, good, yeah, no, go. I started going through them because I'm perfect, um, and uh, uh, and there's some there's some really cool tangents that we're going off on about that. So we'll definitely, I think our next Geek and Dragon should be uh, a follow-up episode on, on those, those sure. new senses. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I love the idea of what, of what Miguel's doing here with the idea where you've got, where if you could tap into another animal or person's brain... And then use that as senses unto your own. Yeah, in this and again, this, and this ties back into last week's episode, or last time's episode, mm. with the sensory addiction. So what if you could have all of your senses, and then on top of that, the sensory input of other things. Right. I mean, that's, and that's, and they are talking about, they're using the vest for this as well, aren't they, to give, to provide feedback? Well, they, yeah, they mentioned that they used a vest with vibrating... Um, vibrating motors to uh, do the feedback on the exoskeleton for the soccer kick. We got to stop wimping out, though. We got to start doing some. Let's get some. Let's get some embedded stuff. You know, let's commit uh, to some technology. Yeah, I mean, I'm the one doing this, so <laughs> what's <in> that? <laughs> All right, good point. Just, yeah. Um, I just I don't know. There's something about it. I just feel like I guess. The, well, the innate issue, I suppose, with technology is that it's obsolete, you know, as soon as it's created, basically. So that the actual hardware would be, you'd have better sensors every, you know, every six months, basically. So that's a, that's an awful lot of surgeries. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you're the guinea pig, feel free to get all the surgeries <laughs> you want. Oh, you know what we should do? <laughs> I, should, I should message him. Uh, we should get a setup like they had at Washington University, mm. where they had uh, one person was the controller, mm. and you played a very simple video game where the other person couldn't see the video game, right. but their brain would be magnetically stimulated to press the button. Oh, that's wild. So your hand would involuntarily press a button when I thought it should. Oh, that's neat. I mean, also terrifying as well. The amazing comments from last video. We're going to do a follow-up on that for sure. So comments yeah. for this one. What would you control? What would you control not, with your brain? Not what would you feel. What would you want? Like, if you could, like, boom, switch, switch, flick a switch, you're controlling some kind of machine or something somewhere else. Or human or rat or monkey. So leave a comment below. Um, if you haven't seen the video, watch it. It's a good one. Right, so until we geek and dragon again, cheerio. Geek and dragon.